Good morning. I want to welcome you to Mount Carmel United Methodist Church. This is part of the Estill Black Swamp Charge, uh, the Estill United Methodist Church, Mount Carmel United Methodist Church, and Furman United Methodist Church. And we meet in an off-setting uh, schedule, so the, the first, the second, and the fourth, we are at um, Estill at 11 o'clock, and then at 9.15 on the first and the third, we're at Furman, and then on the second and the fourth, we're here at Mount Carmel. So glad you're with us this morning, and may, uh, may we all just be in tune to what God has for us. Let's pray. Father, this is quite a world we live in, but Father, you created it. You made everything intrinsically good. So Father, forgive us where we fall short of your, your guidance and your wisdom and your love and your fellowship. And Lord, fill us with your spirit this morning. May your word come to life for us as we uh, dwell again into the book of Amos. And Lord, this is the court of God. So be with us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So if you got your Bibles there, we're going to be looking at Amos uh, chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 6 to the end of the chapter there, verses 6 to the end of the chapter. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, a pair of sandals. They will trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son, go and be with the same girl. And so my holy name is profane. And they, then they lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink wine brought with, fine, with fines they imposed. Yet I destroyed the Amorites before them whose height was like the height of cedars and who was as strong as oaks. So I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you to 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. And I raised you up some of your children to be prophets and some of your youths to be Nazarites. And it is not indeed so. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, says the Lord God. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and you commanded the prophets saying, you shall not prophesy. So I will press you down in, in your place, just as a cart presses down when it is full of sheaves. Flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain their strength, not, nor shall the mighty save their lives. Those who handle the bow shall not stand, and those that are swift on foot, foot shall not save themselves, nor shall those who ride horses save their lives, and those who are stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in the day, says the Lord God Almighty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, these are your words. Bring them to life for us this morning. Lord, may we learn something and may we go from here as disciples of Jesus Christ in his blessed and holy name. Amen. You know, last week we were introduced to a trial dealing with um, the world we live in in the time of the minor prophets. We learned that Israel's neighbors had been pretty naughty and they earn nothing but a big lump of black coal in their stockings. But today, our scripture brings us closer because Amos is presenting a case against the people of God, the very people of God, his family, the chosen. This case is pretty close to home. It deals with our family, our family, the family of God. You know, anyone here old enough to remember Perry Mason? If so, you will remember that he was one of the most watched prosecutors in the world of television. So every show ended with a gotcha moment, a gotcha moment. It was the moment that Perry would spring a surprise on the court and the entire story would change. So it is with the book of Amos. Our scripture for today is God's gotcha moment. If we remember last week's message, we found out that God put the entire neighborhood of Israel on trial and found them guilty. Guilty of their sin, guilty of their crimes, guilty of being inhumane. God changed the entire landscape, and now Israel was standing on the hill laughing at all of them. Little did they know that God's hammer was about to fall on their heads. There are three sections in our scriptures today, and they all lay down God's case against his own people. The people he loved and blessed in so many different ways. 
The same holds true for the church today. We are writing our own case against ourselves, and it's a gotcha moment for all. A gotcha moment for all. The first thing that Amos writes about is Israel's lack of a willingness to listen to their God. Amos writes a list longer than all the neighbors put about how they sinned against God. The bullseye was becoming sharper. The list goes something like this, trafficking, oppression of the poor, family divisions, idolatry, and unruliness in God's holy city. Just to name a few, just to name a few. Apparently, God called the Israelites out on four sins, the same as all the others that they had just heard from Amos' own lips. The depth of the family of God's sin went even deeper, though, deeper, deeper, deeper in hurting and changing society than all the other cities' corruption and sin put together. As we stand on our hill this morning, are we able to even see the similarity to our world, our churches, our church folks? Everything done by Israel's neighbor only scratched the surface concerning being inhumane. Their activities were expected in their times, in their society. The horror we read about was expected because all of the heathens had already done this to each other over and over and over again as they conquered each other again and again and fought against each other. God's creation, God's creation that he said was good, intrinsically good, was just really making the world miserable. But now the people of God had stooped even lower. The deliberate disobedience to God's law was wrong, dead wrong, both physically and spiritually. Listen to what they did. They sold the righteous for silver, mashed the heads of the poor into the dust, took their sandals, denied justice. There was family incest, used the name of God in vain, exploit the less fortunate and take their garments just to place around the altar of Baal, probably to sit upon and to have their way with each other. Get drunk in the house of God. Well, this certainly sounds a lot worse than plowing over a person's crop and home, doesn't it? But God ain't done yet because the target is getting sharper. The bullseye is getting clearer. And then the next section in our scripture tells us what God did for the Israelites, unlike what they did to their fellow family members. Concerning those that waged war against the people of God, he constantly destroyed the foe. God even took care of the giants and took care of the wicked to the roots of the tree. Oaks, you know, have very long, deep roots. Their sin must, these people's sin must have been really bad been killing the very things to which God blessed his people with, even to the depth of the roots of an oak tree. Oh yeah, guys and gals, remember when I led you for 40 years and delivered you, says the Lord God Almighty, what happened to you? You know, Israel's neighbor had done those evil things to the heathen nations surrounding the city of God. But here, God is saying to them through the prophet Amos, you guys, did it against each other in the family, in God's family, in the blessed family of God. You know, there are churches, church members, and churchgoers who are doing the same thing today. No wonder the Christians are asking, why wait, Lord? No wonder it is safer to go down to the neighborhood bar and sit there with friends and family and have a good time than to go to church and listen to people bicker and holler and yell in the name of the Lord. It's scary. As the people of God stood before the bench trying to persuade God that they did these things to make life better for us, the holier than thou set in. They were holier than thou. As we sit here today, respecting each other as Christians, what does our lives say as we stand on our hill looking down at the people of God some thousand years ago? as well as today. What are we thinking? What's our next move in this world to get higher than others? Will we make the right moves to get God's attention, to show off our faith? How will we fare in this trial held by God himself? Well, 
the bullseye is really getting sharper and God is really focusing on it. The most wonderful thing about being in the family of God is knowing full well that he will find enough mercy to cover our sins against him. Verse 16 tells us this, even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day. You know, Amos gives us a picture of complete annihilation. He tells us that the very people of God should expect, expect what they should expect for their actions, their misdeeds, their disobedience. Amos is prophesying the final judgment day. Even the harvesters will be crushed. The swift will not escape. The strong will have no strength. The warrior will not save his own life. The archer will not be able to stand his ground. The fastest soldier, soldiers will not get away. The horsemen will not be able to save their own lives. And again, the bravest will lose all identity and power and become oppressed or even worse, physically dead and spiritually dead. A church that attacks and oppresses their own will never make it into heaven. You know, I watched this young man uh, focus his gun, get his gun focused in on the target. He put a postage stamp sized target on a box and it had to be at least as far away from me as the back doors. And he took a sh first shot, he missed it off to the right, and he turned his gun a little bit, the little sights on there, and turned them in. And while he was able to move, move his shot over uh, to the side, to the side, but it was down below the, the postage stamp size bullseye. And then he turned something else on it, and the next shot was exactly in that, that bullseye, that little postage stamp. And the hole of the bullet was almost as big as a target. God is ready to hit the bullseye. Not only in my personal life, but in all of our personal lives, in the church's personal lives. A church that attacks and oppresses their own will never make it into heaven. We won't. If we don't forgive somebody and forget about it and, and just go on with our lives, the scriptures tell us that. Our churches are stuck on themselves. They will not step out in faith and trust God to carry them through all the trials, especially the one where we will walk in front of the Trinity and be judged for our faith journey. When we love each other in God's spirit, we are one in his spirit. We will be able to do anything, anything that we need to, to bless God and to receive us as his family. Will we climb down from our hill and worship God uh, with all that we are as his disciples? We should know from our Bible studies, our church services, our prayer times, our faith conversations, and our witness that things only happen, only happen, when we are truly God's family united by our faith. The trial continues with even more deliberations next week. Remember, the front seats don't cost a thing. And of course, unlike the deaf and heard trial, there is plenty of room for many to come and see what God is about to do in humanity's trial. You know what? It's good to be a Christian. It's good to love God. It's good to ask for forgiveness. It's good to live in peace with one another. It's good to be a child of God. And we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.